Our text for today is from the Gospel of John, chapter 8, with these words of Jesus in mind. If you abide in my word, you are truly my disciples, and you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. In the name of Jesus. At the center of Jesus' words this morning is truth. Thus, the question of Pilate before the crucifixion of Jesus. What is truth? Pilate, as a student of Greek and Roman philosophy, would have been very concerned with this question and, in fact, has a fairly solid foundation on on what that would be, at least in the case of philosophy. But Jesus is coming at this from a different direction. What is truth? spiritually. The Jews who are listening to him don't comprehend. Thus, they ask, what does this fellow mean that we are enslaved? The seed of Abraham have never been enslaved. And yet, of course, they have been, both historically and spiritually historically being in Egypt in slavery, now even, as Jesus speaks to them, being under Roman rule, but also spiritually since mankind's fall into sin, when Adam and Eve exchanged freedom for slavery, truth for a lie, humanity for something that's decidedly dehumanizing, for it's no longer what God intended us to be. Trying to become deities is the opposite of being a creature and being dependent upon him. What these Jews are struggling with is that which cannot be seen with the eyes. It's revealed by the Spirit. So also, during Martin Luther's time, You had the same enslavement. An enslavement which people thought they could free themselves through their own work. Now, Christ was of absolute importance for eternal salvation, but during Luther's time, the question was, how might I free myself from years in purgatory? What good works can I do? to ensure that I have God's treasury of merits. What the failure there to see is just how deeply sin's corruption lies. But that's been true of humanity throughout time and is still true today. How deeply are we corrupted? Is it just a little bit or... Is it much deeper? Am I generally good? Or has original sin corrupted me in such a way that I can no longer distinguish between that which is true and that which is a lie, further freedom and slavery? At least in a recent article by Robert Draper in The Atlantic, He thinks one group of people has become detached from the truth, arguing that recent attacks, such as the one on Nancy Pelosi this past week, at least her husband, would be from the detachment from truth and reality by one particular party. No, no, it lies much deeper than political parties and political pundits. The truth is that we are corrupted. And by demonizing others, in fact, what we're doing is simply going further on the path of dehumanization, no longer seeing each other as those who have been created in the image of God, albeit corrupted, but instead something far less than that. It would be wise to put a check on the other side of the line as well. That is, that those who try try to transcend, transcend their humanity are, in fact, dehumanizing themselves. Playing God with the body 
is in fact taking that which God created and turning it into something far different. We are male and female, given to one another in holy matrimony, one man, one woman to bring forth life. This is not something to be trifled or played with, but instead God's divine order. To deny that truth is once again to deny our humanity, what it truly means to be human. So we're in a real mess, aren't we? Spiritually blind, denying the truth, on the way to death, slaves to sin. What then is needed? That which Christ gives in the gospel this morning. And that is both law and gospel. Everyone who commits a sin is a slave to sin. There isn't a way to free yourself. You are not your own redeemer. You need help. The slave, after all, doesn't remain in the house forever. No, only the son. So what's the solution? To deny the self and live a perfect life free from sin? Yes. But where can that come from? Corrupted by sin, we naturally desire sin. It's kind of like being addicted to something, whether that happens to be a coffee every morning or something far harder. We can't free ourselves because sin has sunk its claws into us. It's as if we are children of the devil. Jesus does say that, by the way, of these same people who are talking with him just a little bit later in the gospel. Yes, every day is a struggle with this addiction to sin. And the punishment? Exile. You will not remain in the Father's house forever. But there's hope. The Son remains forever. The Son being Christ Jesus, who came to earth taking on your flesh as well as coming to redeem you from your sin. Yes, the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. He who went forth to the cross shedding his blood, the propitiation for your sins, sets you free indeed and makes you a son in those waters of holy baptism so that you may abide in the Father's house forever, not a slave to sin, but freed, no longer dehumanized, but human, just the way God created you to be. But I keep struggling with sin. How then can I be free? A good question. First, let's not deny it as if we are perfect. No. Instead, we come confessing our sins. And God, who is faithful and just, forgives you your sins cleanses you from all unrighteousness, gives you the gift of his heavenly kingdom. Second, let's abide in his word. Martin Luther, writing in about 1526 about the German divine service, uh, a service in the language of the people, which was not something new. In fact, it was about four years old by the time Luther gets around to writing his service. Notes this for parents. Teach your children not only the catechism, but also God's word. So when you go home, 
think about God's word in this way, as if you have two purses, and so speaking to your children, teach them that the first purse is the purse of faith, with two pockets. The first pocket, place into it the law. That word which convicts of sin. You are a slave, and a slave does not remain forever. In the second pocket, put the gospel. But if the Son sets you free, you will be free indeed. We're abiding in Christ's word, just as he is abiding in us, hearing both the law that convicts and the gospel which justifies, forgives, renews, lifts up, gives life, sets free. But the Son truly sets you free. What about this second purse, though? The second purse is the purse of love. Again, two pockets. The first pocket to tell you the way you shall serve your neighbor. The second, for suffering. Because in the midst of suffering, God gives the love that endures all things or bears all things, hopes all things, never gives up. Neither on one another, for God did create us all. Let us see each other not as enemies, but not only as those whom God created, but also as those who God has redeemed, who need forgiveness of sins and life and freedom. And finally, be prepared to suffer for the truth. The God who promises to be with you every step of the way also promises that as you abide in Him, you have freedom and life and salvation. The peace of God that passes all understanding, keep your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus our Lord.